Hey, yeah, uh, the story will, it will be an ongoing story until Alistair Clarkson commits, if he commits at all, to a coaching job. There's two in the, at the moment in the market, one's at the Giants and one's at North Melbourne. Uh, Sonia Hood has reportedly had a short conversation with James Henderson at the footy last week when James Henderson was a guest at Cricket Tasmania. Yep. Now, that may have been, oh, hi, we want to catch up, or it might have been, uh, it might have been a bit more, but it's said to have been about 10 minutes. It's hotting up. What would appear to have been more significant, for the third time the GWS Giants announced the Clarkson caught up, and it was all captured exclusively <laughs> and first by Channel Wisp. Well, it happened yesterday. So uh, Mitch Cleary, who does a great job at uh, sniffing stories out and that type of thing, so he he gets some sort of a heads up that uh, Dave Matthews and uh, Jimmy Bartell are going to meet with Al Clarkson and his manager, James Henderson. Well, the art of good uh, good journalistic um, news hounding is to anticipate. That's okay, right. Okay, if they're yeah. going to meet, where might they meet? And sometimes, it, and these are back on our footy show days, sometimes you, you might send ca- cameras to two or three different spots, but it is an investment in the story. It is. And it was, uh, it was a big investment in the story yesterday. And uh, we had two of the journos there and camera crews and made sure it was staked out the whole joint all day. So finally you get that shot. You know, you've got Dave Matthews and Jimmy Bartell walking across the street. Then you catch up with Dave Matthews post uh, the interview with Clarko. You know that he's in there with James Henderson, his manager. And then we get uh, shots of James Henderson and Clarko leaving the meeting. What are we making of it? Um, Alistair Clarkson's doing his, uh, obviously, his due diligence, um, gathering information. The suggestion would, the suggestion is that the... I don't, I never saw him motivated by money, Clarko, right? Clarko, he, he was no. always competent. And Alistair Clarkson, when Hawthorne were trying to establish themselves, for went forego mm. part of his salary and he diverted that back so he can employ specialist kicking coach or a special whatever. He said to yep. Hawthorne, listen, take X amount away from me so that I can. Yep. That has been his attitude, right? Yep. So that is what I think is consistent. Now, he'll be well paid if he ever comes back. It'll be a million dollars plus, wherever that may there's this figure of 1.6 that's been bandied around. I don't know that to be the case or not. It would put enormous pressure on your soft cap if that was the case. Yeah. And now there's some talk about maybe the G- GWS Giants will <clears throat> seek some compensation outside the soft cap. Outside the cap and in an ab- ambassadorial role because they did. Eddie did speak to Dave Matthews and he spoke about the fact that that's what they would be hoping and attempting to do because – Coaching GWS is bigger than just coaching the team. Right. There's a bigger role to play, which goes outside sort of the parameters of just being a coach. Soft cap's been very yeah. uh, a controversial and emotive issue. Clubs have been screaming for two years, we need more money in our soft cap. We've lost coaches, which has impacted not only playing the ability to coach our players on field, but off field yep. and welfare. What's the likelihood that they would get some uh, compensation and ambassadorial money for a coach? The Giants. I think that two things. I think the AFL would dearly love for the GWS to be successful because of what they've already embarked upon and the growth of the game up there in that part of Sydney, the west of Sydney. So I think that they'd be thinking, okay, if it means that we can get somebody like a Clarkson up there, they can be successful, they can win a flag and hopefully – they can cement their yep. spot there, then that's great for the game overall. Well, you've, you've, what are we prepared to pay for that maybe to happen? Mm. Well, but you've heard Clark, you've heard um, Dimmer, you've heard Johnny Longmire, you've heard uh, Lukey Beveridge, all of them railing against the fact yep. that the soft cap's been cut from under them and how much it's compromised them. How do you reckon you front up to Luke Beveridge and said, listen, I know you blokes have been doing it hard and all that sort of stuff, but just for the good of the game and Clarko up mm. at the Giants, we're going to let them you know, have 400 outside the soft cap. All's not fair in love and war in this, though. And yeah. the AFL will – the, you know, like they can make a decision that is going to benefit the game, what they perceive to go to benefit the game long term, and they'll say, okay, that's an investment in the game. Mm. I think the part about this would be, though, if it comes back to money – and you've got GWS who gets some assistance from the AFL outside that soft cap. And they're competing against North Melbourne who probably won't get the same assistance and they lose out on a coach because the AFL are giving that monetary assistance to GWS. It just doesn't seem fair. Makes but as I said, like nothing in this game is necessarily meant to be fair. Makes for an interesting conversation, doesn't it? So um, we'll, we'll watch and see where that... Where would you go? If you're Al Clarkson, you had just... You had those two jobs and you had those lists. Obviously, one list is better than the other. Where do you think you would go as a coach? 
from a, from a list perspective, I'd go to the Giants, right? But then that's not the only thing to consider, no. though, is it? So the living situation, the you know taking your f- family, although his family by that stage would be just he and Karen, probably his wife. Um, I don't know. It's just whether he's got a, his head around. He's I know how ensconced he is here. I know he loves getting down to his place on the peninsula, all that sort of stuff. So whether he'd be prepared to move to Greater Western Sydney. That might be problematic. That might be one of the reasons they need some some assistance outside the cap to try and lure him up there. These are hard questions to answer, I know, but uh, given that this was, I think, the third meeting between GWS and Clarkson, it would say to me that they're they're heading down the road, like they're a fair way down the track if you're having a third meeting. Yeah, th- yeah three meetings does suggest that's the case. Um, what constitutes a first meeting would be interesting, you know, like – have have North Melbourne and the Clarkson camp had their first meeting, or was it a five minute meet at the footy on Friday? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but it would suggest they're serious, and of course they're going to be serious about it. Um, does Alec? He might just sit back. I mean, it's the door been shut on every other coaching potential coaching vacancy. I know these are the two that have been declared. He might think, no, well, I'm prepared to sit, and if something spits out at the end of the year, good. If not, I can wait another twelve months. I don't know the answer. I don't think he wants to wait another twelve months. Yeah, but I'm not getting the feeling that he wants to sit on the sidelines and wait another yeah, 12 no. months. Yeah, no. My conversations with him is he's very cognizant of, you know, the longer you're out of the game, the more you you sort of your fingerprints on what's happening uh, are lost, but gee, I don't know. And it's 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 an interesting one. So, we'll watch this space, but it does appear it's good. They will want these announcements made within the next couple of weeks, would they not? Yeah. Would you be thinking also with GWS though that if they've got Clarks in there and they've interviewed him three times, he would be the number one ob- objective that they have. That's what we think. And Damien Barrett's written the, that article about North Melbourne, that it, that is exactly the case at North Melbourne. And that, it would be too because yeah, of who he is, now, well, Clarkson. We, we, we think that, but we're also a very pro the Clarkson camp. I mean, the, there's a narrative around that he's – and I don't agree with this in any way, shape or form, that the clubs are scared to take him on because of the so-called baggage that comes with him. Well, which, that is real. And you talk about that baggage. No, no, I do. I under. Yep, yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to say this: the baggage that you're talking about is the fact that he is such a big personality. Yeah. That yeah. he wants to drive the club, meaning he might want to be driving the CEO, and he might want to be driving the yeah. chairman or the president at the same time. Yeah. And so they're saying Hawthorne people are saying, well, you know, buyer beware. Yeah. And part of that baggage is so heavy because there was four cups in the bottom of the baggage. That's right. That's mm. right. So but, I don't buy into any of that. Well, yeah, he's a strong personality, but if you're a strong football club, then you should be able to be equipped to be able to handle Look, a strong personality as a coach. When I, I, say, this when I say I don't buy into it, I understand and I, and I agree with what you're saying, but I don't think that should be a factor. When was the last time we had a non-strong personality coach be successful in our game? Yeah. Like That's part of what your football club is, is managing your coach. Yeah, and Damien Hardwick's had moments. Um, Simon Goodwin has, you would think that he's not, but there's been you know, reports that the, of some of the um, conflict that had been through that club over the 12 months before he got his premiership. You don't think Kevin Sheedy was Kevin Sheedy somebody was. that David Parkin, pushed the envelope and was a management Dennis issue Fagan. at different times? Pagan. You don't get a shrinking violet. Well, Barassi. No shrinking violets are going to – oh, he could get a nice coach. He's going to be agreeable and amenable and better and talk and, you know, and get on with everyone. You yep. just might not win anything. Bomber Thompson, like anyone that's been successful, has challenged their own football club at different times. I just want to ask you about the Brisbane Lions. I want you to tell me mm. how much pressure, if any, there may be none in your eyes, is there on Chris Fagan and, and by extension, his football club to – you know, to deliver and and do something this year. Yeah, there is. There is uh, there is pressure on him and he would be feeling it too because they went out there and they recruited for the now and they have been close to, you know, playing off in the big game at the end of the year. They haven't been able to get there. They've been hit by a couple of injuries, but they've got all those guys back again now. Their key forwards are back. So he, took over he, would, be feeling, he would be feeling the heat. 2017 was his first year. They finished last, hmm. right? which was understandable. Next year, he got them to 15th. The next year, he got them to 5th, then to 4th, then to 5th. So he's mm. had great success in turning them around in the short term. Yep. But now, is the question is, okay, it's good. You've got them competitive. Yep. You've got them to finals. You've got them to one preliminary final where they haven't been able to you know, get beyond that. 
I mean, is there is there pressure for them to strike while this? You know, absolutely, absolutely. Is- there's pressure, and if you look at those teams, if you ask anybody or you look at their performance this year, you'd have to say, where have they improved from last year? Is there any part of their game? I know you had some stats. You had some great stats on your show, your little show on Monday night, and uh, they're not nearly as good at defending as what they were this time last year. No, they aren't. And they're, and attack my, my and query aggression with, around the ball, all those things are slightly down on where they were. My question about them, and I might be proved wrong by the end and for the Brisbane fans, I hope so, is that can you see or can you rely on a Danaher Hipwood McStay triumvirate delivering you beyond the first weeks of the finals. Well, you should be able to. You should be able to. Like there are three, there are three really, really capable forwards. But have they got the components elsewhere in their game? Are they capable finals, big time finals forwards? Or well, are they, they look really like capable home and away forwards. Well, I don't. I, I think it's. I think forwards in this game are the beneficiaries of what happens forward up forward of forward of them, right? And how you move the ball and you know, your midfield construction and that type of thing and the power that you've got in the midfield. So I don't necessarily say it's the forward's problem not getting the job done, but I think they're breaking down in other areas of their game. And to answer my own question is that w- would they be any better or worse than Ben Brown, Tom McDonald and Bailey Fritch? Uh, no, but then I would answer that question by saying they don't have – Clayton Oliver, they Lockie don't have Neal. Petrarca. They, yeah, but okay, they've got Lockie Neal, but they don't have Petrarca. They don't have Clayton Oliver. They don't have Jack Viney. They don't have Brayshaw in their midfield. So I think that's still going to be their problem, the mm. depth and strength of their midfield. So where, so they contend again, they'll be in the finals, maybe not top four. They might win a final. Maybe they, say they win one final and then out. Mm. What, what, what's that going to tell you about them? And They've plateaued. They're... They've plateaued as a team and a group. Right. There's the headline. <laughs> but right now, okay, and this, this, it, it, they have to improve. And, you know, like we wouldn't be telling uh, Chris Fagan anything that he's not aware of, acutely aware of. And they have to improve in this last four weeks before the finals. That's what they've got to do. They've got to accelerate mm. their performances in that period of time. They've got to make some changes. They've got to find something in this last month that's going to serve them well so that they can give a great account of themselves in that final month of football. They haven't got there yet. No. And, and they, they it could start this weekend. It could, yeah. Because the MCG has not been a happy hunting ground for the Brisbane Lions. They look all at sea when they get there. Uh, Brisbane have finished second, second and fourth, not fourth, fifth and fourth. Well, there, that, therein lies the problem. They haven't finished second, second and fourth. By the season's end, they've finished... Fifth, fourth, and fifth. Maybe by the end on of the, the home, ladder, yeah. By the end of the home and away, they finish second, second, and fourth. But then they aren't able to turn that. By that, by that measurement, you're saying they've played in two grand finals and a prelim, which they haven't. They have played in one prelim and lost in fin- in the other two final series. And that is my question, I guess. Mm. And it'll be answered in the next four to six weeks. Charlie Cameron, yes, he can kick goals. Kick five. In a final uh, for Adelaide, he kicked five against Melbourne um, in a quarter final. So he kicked three in the quarter, qualifying final, rather quarter final, qualifying final against Richmond as well. So he's one that can do it. If you're the footy manager of Essendon, and I'm Dylan, I'm Dyson Heppel. I've walked in. I said, "G'day, uh, Josh Marnie. Yep. Uh, you want me to play next year?" Ah, uh, yes, yes. Good. How much are you going to give me? And how many years? I'd, uh, well, apparently the report is that he's been offered a one-year deal. He's 30 years of age. Um, I, I think that's reasonable. I think that's fair right, 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 as to where he's at right now regarding his on-field playing contribution. And I think he's one of those guys that it would be a year-by-year contract okay. that you'd be looking at. So we've established that you want me to play on uh, – Damien Barrett reported that he was underwhelmed. I'm underwhelmed with the offer. That is true. That is a true story. What, no, no, I'm asking. We're role playing. Okay. Yep. Hey, Josh, you've given me an offer. I'm underwhelmed. Yep. I'm underwhelmed. And what's the question? Well, how much can you give me? <laughs> well, that's the deal, and we'll put some incentives. How much is it? We'll put some incentives into your contract, and if you reach those triggers, then you'll be able to not only make more money, right. you will also trigger – a contract next year. Okay, so just as I walk away to, to contemplate this with uh, the Dahl, at the very top end, what's the most I can earn? And at the bottom end, what's the most? So right now, the contract is for what? 
I don't know. I don't know. No, what no, it, we're role playing. I know, but he would be on a lot of money now. He would have been on a lot of money. What? And he, so it would be a significant haircut that he would be being asked to accept. So can I take can I take away from this, Josh, that I'll get 500? Mm, I don't know whether well, or not is. you'll be able to earn 500. It is underwhelming. Well, it's not underwhelming. Man. That's still a lot of money. That's still a lot of money. That's still a lot of money. This is what you have to take into consideration with Dyson, okay? He's not getting any better as a player. He's not getting any quicker as a player. But he has always been a great club man. He's the captain of the team. He's got experience. He's a great person to have around the club. But at some point, you know, sometimes players' careers come to an end, you know, at 30 years of age. Sometimes they come to an end at 35 years of age. So at this point, he's getting a one-year deal. Hear that noise? What's that? That was a dead door slamming. Well, you're not <laughs> ever going to be happy. I walk out. You're never going to be happy if somebody turns around and says, okay, we're not prepared to give you a long-term deal and we're not prepared to pay you what you've been paid. I mean, nobody is going to be happy about that. Do you think he'll be there next year? Yeah, I think he will be there okay. next year. Let's go through a few names that have constantly been thrown up in recent times. Josh Dunkley's future, what can you tell us? Yeah, still no clarity on it, to be honest. He has a long-term contract offer in front of him from the dogs, so there's obviously interest there to keep him. They want to keep him. But there's also interest out there from rivals, including Port Adelaide, who we wrote today uh, on Inside Trading, are among the clubs pursuing him. So, of course, his partner does play netball in Adelaide for the Thunderbirds. So there is that link there in South Australia. But two years after wanting to walk out to Essendon, his value is different now, but he's played every game, averaged 25 disposals. So had a pretty strong season, but... We're obviously at round 20, guys, and he's still weighing things up there with the power well in the mix if he decides to look around. My mail is that don't discount the club that came hard for him last time. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've still got some interest there, I believe. We, we spoke about that a little bit ago, and as we spoke about just then, they, the Dogs wanted two top 10 or two first-round picks from him last time. That's not going to be his value this time, given he's out of contract. So a year away from free agency. So wherever he does sign, I think this is... His free agency deal, this is his big deal. If he stays at the Dogs, it's his big deal. If he leaves, it's his big deal. So it's a, it's a career-defining point in, in what he does, Josh Dunkley. Hey, Cal, we've just been talking about the, the Brisbane Lions. What can you tell us about Darcy Gardner and where his contract is at? Yeah, he's a bit of a, a forgotten free agent, I think, Tim. He's one of only four restricted free agents left unsigned at this late stage of the year. Now, the others are Angus Brayshaw. Obviously, you guys spoke to him earlier in the week. John Dugowie and Lance Franklin. So we're obviously all talking about all of those guys. Darcy Gardner still is un, is a restricted free agent, but uh, not yet signed beyond this year at the line. Contract talks have gone pretty slowly, started earlier in the year, but no deal has been reached yet. Rival clubs are watching that one with some interest, given the lack of key position players on the free agency market. I still think the most likely thing is he stays at the line, but he's the best key back out there in the group, in the free agency group. Alex Pierce signed up. He had some interest from from other clubs as well. So attention on Darcy Gardner there at the line. Given the interest in the key defensive positions out there and the players that are possibly able to play that role, Liam Jones, are you hearing what I'm hearing about Liam Jones and that is that uh, he'll end up a Bulldog on a three-year contract? Well, he's met with a few clubs and a few clubs are watching him pretty closely. I think that's a, a, they're definitely in the mix there for him. And the interesting part is going to be how he does he get to the club. I think that's the next step and clubs are still surveying that. Is it, is it a free agency move? Is it some sort of trade with, with Carlton? What compensation does Carlton get? So there's a little bit of con- confusion there about how that move actually does get made, but I think the dogs are, are right in that mix, yeah. A couple of small forwards, one that's more established than the other, Guelphy and Toby Bedford. What, what news on those two? Yeah, new deals looming for both of those guys, guys. Guelphy in career best form for the Bombers, out of contract, but talks underway for a new deal there. He deserves that. He's been really good this year, I think, playing forward now. Found his position for the Bombers. And the Demons are looking to tie down Toby Bedford. As always, with the successful teams, clubs come looking for the fringe players, but he's uh, he's a wanted man at the Demons. And as Riley Beveridge reports, uh, the D's looking at a multi-year extension for Bedford to stay at Melbourne. A couple of Saints signed on. Yeah, they have. Josh Gablitz reporting today that uh, Ben Patton and Cooper Sharman have signed for two more years through to the end of 2024. So Sharman, a mid-season success story from last year, and Ben Patton back in the side this year after that badly broken leg. So a key part of their future on the halfback. All right, let's get into the stuff that I love. And I know that you are the number one authority on the uh, draft, potential draft, these young 18 champs. Have they finished, by the way? Is that all wound up? 
uh, essentially, there's one more game to go in September, but the, the championships for the Allies, South Australia and WA are over. Big Country and Big Metro will meet in Grand Final Week, which will actually be the Grand Final of the Carnival, as it's turned out, mm. both sides unbeaten. And that'll be really good in the sense that George Wardlaw and Elijah Sardis, who are both potential top five picks, and also Braden George from Big Country, they'll be back from injury. So it's kind of worked out quite good that they'll have a full list available, hopefully, by then. I always like to pick one out um, as I sit down and have a look. You got one. I've got one. Uh, he's a Western Australian boy. His name's Ruben Gimby. What can you tell us yeah. about him? Yeah, I like him, Gary. I, I know you were watching a couple of weeks ago when he played one of his best games uh, for Western Australia against Vic Metro. He went head-to-head with Will Ashcroft in the second quarter, third quarter of that game, and he was really good in that second term. So he's a bigger-bodied midfielder, Gaz. He's Started the year as an intercept defender. He's, 100, he's 188, 189 centimetres. Now he's playing midfield. So that's a good story. I like the fact he's been able to play two yeah. positions. He's hard at it. I think he's a smoky for the top 10. A lot really? of people look at him oh. and his form and just thinking that this guy can rise and rise and rise. He's he not wasn't... there yet, I don't think. You, Gary, you he... said this bloke was a smoky that no one would be talking oh, about. Now he... we're talking about a top 10 prospect. I thought he'd be well outside that. Um, he just got a beautiful frame on him. Where do you see this kid? He's got big shoulders and he's a power athlete. Okay. Well, it's not a yeah, calendar contest. You know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Hey, what about – how good is this Will Ashcroft? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> He's very good. He'd be playing in every AFL team this year. He's he's the Sam Walsh prototype. A lot a lot of talk around the Nick Dacos type. He's a different type of player than Nick Dacos. I think he's Sam Walsh, just so relentless with his running. He went back to NAB League level last week and had 42 touches just on the bit. That's just what he does. So yeah. he, he he's ready for the next level and we'll be playing some more VFL footy for the line soon as well, I think. So just tell us how that's going to work then. So he's, he's probably the standout. Well, he's the standout number one pick right now. Um, Brisbane have got a pick, um, the opportunity to go for him first. So how's that going to play out? Yeah, they're going to have to match a bid pretty early. Obviously, there's... Um, He's making that decision in terms of nominating to the Lions or going in the open pool. The, the North Melbourne Footy Club obviously has to pick one at the moment. So there's that option for him to, to potentially stay in Victoria and not nominate. I still believe and have thought all the way through that he will nominate the, the Lions and get there. The interesting thing for the Lions, though, guys, is that, yes, they've got Will Ashcroft at the very, very top of the draft, but Jasper Fletcher, the son of Adrian Fletcher, has actually come into the first-round calculations now because of how well he's played this year. And he's a midfielder too. So the Lions are going to have to need a stack of points right. to, to match mm. bids for Ashcroft at the top, and then also Fletcher around that top 15 to 20 mark. So it's good for them to have these two guys coming through, and uh, they'll have to just plan to boost up their points in trade period. They should get a couple of picks in there. And just uh, just as we let you go, always of great interest is the big key forward. If you, is there one that looms in the top 10? There was a big country boy that was playing pretty good footy as a key forward. Yeah, there is. There's a guy called Aaron Cadman, who's a big left-footed key forward. Yes. He, he reminds me a bit of Harry Mackay when he was coming through the draft in 2015. So strong mark, 196 centimetres. Not quite as tall as Harry Mackay, but he's been a consistent goal kicker for Vic Country. He also kicked 23 goals in the NAB League. He kicked five last weekend as well. So we love the players, Gary, who play well in the championships. And the first thing they do is go and dominate at NAB League level, under 18 level in their local comp. But he's done that. So I think he... Should be the first tall pick at this point, and there'll be a lot of clubs inside that top 10 looking at Aaron Cadman.